Okay, this is from a book, Dr. Tullio Simoncini. He is an Italian oncologist who's made some very interesting discoveries about cancer. And the name of the book is Cancer is a Fungus, a Revolution in Tumor Therapy. The first part of the book starts off about um, philosophy, how our mind-body paradigm is failing us in being able to deliver the, uh, the health that we should have. And towards the middle of the book, page 84, he talks about the real odds for cancer survival, and it's a real eye-opener. So as simple as his therapy is, he has a very profound philosophy behind it and a lot of consideration and study before he got to his, um, to his simple therapy and his, and his good success rates. But let's take a look at what uh, the condition is, uh, generally speaking, in the world today regarding cancer. The real odds for cancer survival Everyone knows that cancer is an inexorable disease that gives no chance to those who are affected. Every one of us is aware that when an acquaintance, a relative, or a friend becomes sick with this terrible disease, his or her chances of survival are very slim, and only a miracle can save them. Conversely, official statistics show percentages that are very encouraging and report an average recovery rate of, all, of about 50%. That means that one person out of every two is saved. On the one hand, therefore, we see high mortality statistics coming from the real world. On the other, we see percentages that are somewhat reassuring and stem from scientific analysis. How did we get to such a contradiction? What are the motives and the causes that at this point just produce a feeling of resignation among citizens? I believe that the distorting comments can be divided into three categories. Those that are related to the individual researcher, those where data is elaborated in a subjective manner, and those which are simply accepted in an uncritical manner. To the first category belong, one, conformity, a mental behavior that tends to take for granted what is proposed by other researchers. Two, complacency. This behavior is stimulated most of the time by the actual conditions in which the researcher finds himself. For example, the structure in which he operates, economic compensations, and so on. The information acquired is consciously or unconsciously interpreted according to the way the research has been set up, that is, in a preconceived cognitive disposition. Three, bad faith a self-serving behavior in which people who are aware that a notion is false pass it on nonetheless. Four, fraud, where the data is consciously falsified. Five, fear. This can take various forms, fear of mistakes, fear of causing damage, fear of being reported to authorities, of looking bad, and more. The elements of distortion belong to the second category. These elements are represented by those conditions of the researcher attributable to his mental structure and mental form formation. In this case, one can talk about thoughtlessness. Six, lack of preparation. This is the case where a researcher who is very good in his specific field of research lacks sufficient knowledge of other scientific arguments that are related to his studies. Seven, lack of reason. This occurs when data is accepted, which is actually not acceptable. For example, the statistical data on bladder carcinoma shows a survival rate ranging from 13 to 45 percent. Eight, lack of attention. Here the conditions are similar to those of the preceding point. In this case, however, the results and the wacky data normally furnished by oncological studies are neither identified nor focused on because the scholars busy with other affairs, political, institutional, managerial, or other, actually have no stimulation or interest to really understand in depth what they are studying. Nine, lack of energy. Unfortunately, we are all immersed in a world with too fast a pace where we need to act frantically to keep in step with it. If we would add to this that medicine is a very complex and compelling discipline, one can easily understand how doctors and academics are subjected to workloads and mental stresses that are extremely high. 
All these factors that condition a doctor or a researcher generally without his awareness belong to the third category. 10. Passive acceptance of dominating ideas and ideologies. Some examples should suffice. Knowledge always acts gradually. Experimentation is the only appropriate instrument for medical progress. Neoplastic disease has multifactorial origin. 11. Passive acceptance of ideas and theories from eminent researchers. One of the most common human mistakes is that of believing that the ideas and the opinions of doctors and scientists that are in eminent positions are more valid than the opinions of others. So, for example, when a Nobel Prize winner, a doctor who is a former government minister, a full university professor, or even the man on the street who ends up being on television comments on important themes such as the state of medical research, the developments of anti-cancer therapies or something else, we tend to accept what is said in an uncritical manner, as if what we hear were some kind of divine word. Twelve, uh, reverence towards the great researchers of the past. This attitude tends to overestimate the great figures of history and to accept their theories. Although the evolution of scientific thinking demonstrates that most of the time they are false and or belong only to the history of ideas. 13. Passive acceptance of studies that are planned on a world scale. The elements of distortion that we have examined induce scientists to often commit gross errors of judgment and these errors get amplified each time they pass from researcher to researcher. This is particularly true in oncology where because of the absence of a rational principle and thread, the exact opposite of what is officially said takes place. Officially, on the one hand, we hear of the constant achievement of positive results, but at the same time, we hear of the constant in increment of cancer deaths. Doctors, scholars, and scientists parade their confidence while we see people who are desperate before the inexorable spread of the disease. How can such antithetic realities coexist? It is clear that the people who suffer and continue to die have the right to a cure. Everything else just sounds like jackasses brain reverberating more loudly by being accompanied by conceited authority. What about the role of scholars, scientists, ministers, professional orders, scientific journals, journalists, and educational broadcasting? Is it possible that they all lie? worse. They create a junk information network where, except for a few exceptions, most are in bad faith, and the rest are conformists, complete with degrees and exploited for the sole purpose of servitude to economic interests. At this point, we should ask ourselves whether the statistics and scientific facts that are so freely bandied about are true or are products of imagination. Granted that they already contain, as we hope to have demonstrated, remarkable elements of distortion, it seems useful to explore these statistics much more closely and to analyze the, da the data that is officially reported. Here comes the surprise. Even with all the tricks and distortions of st statistics, a rate of cancer recovery gravitating around 7% is reported in classical books and treatises. That means that after the necessary corrections, the rate is effectively zero, as shown in Table 1, next page. Here's the table. What is it then that allows the scholars to package those captivating and reassuring statistical tables that keep on conning public opinion? The trick is possible if you work in that no man's land that separates real tumors from those diseases that are not tumors. Let me explain this better. There is an international classification, the TNM system, that classifies tumors on the basis of their gravity. They are subdivided into stages 1, 2, 3, 4, and into subgroups. It is clear to any trained eye that initial lesions that are doubtful or at the limit of malignancy represent the overwhelming majority of the observed neoplasias. It is equally clear how often these presumed neoplasias, which are often subject to both misunderstanding and manipulation, inflate those statistics to the point of implausibility. 
So in the early stages of tumors, the dubious ones, the recovery rates are extremely high, while in the following stages, that is, where they certainly are tumors, the rates are barely above zero. The example of skin neoformations, as they can be analyzed in a direct manner, may be useful in helping to understand such a contradictory system better. It is self-evident that of all the nodules that can be observed, malignant tumors, benign tumors, cysts, lymphomas, dermatitis, warts, small scars, and more, just a tiny proportion belong to the category of neoplasias. For the neoformations of the internal organs, where it is not possible to directly see and check, and check, it is legitimate instead to expect, almost as a rule, both error and deceit. The statistical manipulation phenomenon we have described above becomes even more obvious in its complexity when the objects of the study are those intelligent, are those malignant neoplasias that in themselves tend to have benign characteristics, such as, for example, those of the thyroid, other glands, and other organs that are well structured. Where distortions and misunderstanding are difficult to implement, as for example in parasimal organs in that is lung, liver, or brain, the recovery statistics instead report negligible values because the statistics are forced to show the truth. In conclusion, where does the famous 50% recovery rate come from? From fraud. We must also highlight that the success of surgical remover, removal of neoformations under one centimeter are of little interest as they never create a problem. Conversely, if they wanted to demonstrate their effectiveness, the official oncological therapies should cure or at least achieve regression of the advanced neoplasias. But here, no doubt, the failure of classical oncology is complete.